Con is T-O-E. Welcome to the Candle Tales podcast. My name is Aaron Hegarty and I'm on Zoom with my sister. And I'm Sarah Hegarty and we're sitting down to talk about the last story in our podcast, which is part of our Goddess series, which we're doing throughout the month of February. And uh, this one was a little bit rough. Oh, Jesus Christ, I'm after just listening to it. Um, it was brilliant, it was beautiful, brilliant. Um, and, you know, probably mentioned that our Patreon supporters, thanks, um, <laughs> as we always do. But anyway, uh, yeah, no, sorry, this one was beautiful. I've heard you tell this uh, before. In a previous episode, I've done uh, the story of Saiv and mostly from Fiona McCool's perspective. And I guess it was very interesting to hear a number of, I guess, things that we've been looking at. And like, it's hilarious. We're, we're recording this now uh, a week uh, in advance. Um, and it's actually Valentine's Day. So to oh, have listened right. to one of the all time um, unromantic stories, like there's a brief bit of love in there that just, uh, and she's still trapped in fear. I mean, there's a few, po- there's a good few po- talking points in the story because A, I love the story. I've always loved it. Uh, you tell mm-hmm. it beautifully. Uh, Rue Shea did a masterclass at pacing it, playing piano, mind it, which I just want to give a massive shout out mm-hmm. because, um, you know, he's going through his own uh, uh, dealings with life under COVID and everything, and he's doing great mm-hmm. with, with that. But um, using this as a brilliant cathartic release, I think the sadder the story is, the better he tends to do. <laughs> I don't know. I feel the same about me, to be honest, when it comes to stories. Some mm. of us really get our teeth into the the, the sad stuff. Um, yeah. And this was definitely, I think, yeah, like you said, maybe it's COVID catharsis as well. Um, well, it's been interesting as well because we just um, finished, and by the time this goes out, we'll have started up another storytelling course, which was just mm-hmm. gorgeous to be able to do and create with people. And one of the participants chose the Sive story uh, to tell from Sive's, Sive's perspective without mm-hmm. if you had done this at all. As and it's amazing to hear people tell the same stories. And how different they can be. Same with the Curse of Maka, two different participants told that story and how different they can be in a person's voice. And after I telling this story, I think it's episode 12, if I'm not mistaken, maybe it's maybe it's episode four. Um, actually, it, it was early enough. It was definitely one of the one of the earliest ones that we did mm. was uh, was you telling the, the side story from would like, as you said, from Fionn's perspective, as it is usually told. It's usually the story of Fionn's first love or Oshin's mother. Um, so it's it's usually not told from her perspective. It's it's and that's why we call this kind of Sive story, because this is Sive story from Sive's point of view, which is terrible. It, it is. It's like it's terrible anyway. <laughs> like that's mm. the thing. Like it's heartbreaking anyway, but it's always heartbreaking because she's stolen away, heartbreaking because uh, you know, the love is gone, heartbreaking because the son doesn't have the mother, the husband doesn't have the wife, heartbreaking because the of the absence. But then when you actually put it into the living through it, the the fear that rap, or, traps her. And I guess, you know, we often talk about putting two and two together or how we've added stuff up and uh, come up with a slightly different framework. Mm. And that's the joy of, of telling these stories again. We've received them they're the most of the ingredients are still there. We're quite true to most of them. And every now and again, there's something that can maybe not quite fit. And I think that the um the greatest kind of uh reframing, I suppose, it, it, of this story that you crafted so beautifully, and I think it makes it so more powerful, so much more powerful, was how Sive turned from fear and from anguish and terror and she went to her kind of almost natural habitat with the deer and she became a deer but Mm. that kind of autonomy is hers and it's not Mm. the curse of an evil druid turning her into a deer and it makes so much more sense when you put it into the the framework of the two Mm. edanin who were shapeshifters and who were able to do this anyway and why would why exactly did the fardarag change her to a deer anyway well you see that was that was a thing that never really made much sense to me because he's a man who wants to he wants to possess her he wants to marry her he wants to dominate her and 
the the fact that she was a deer always seemed to me like a protection mm. um in a in a bit of a weird way admittedly sure. um but i and I'm, and i'm not the only person to to kind of reinterpret it that way i i remember richard marsh telling me about um i think a canadian writer who who rewrote the sive story as a kind of a a fantasy genre thing where again sive is the one who who decides to shapeshift into a deer okay right. um so like it's not it's not unique to me i remember him telling me that after he after i told the story of sive in, in one of our live shows and i was like oh my god we got we both like you can come to the same conclusion as other people as well mm. um so like there are it, it it's it was an interpretation that kind of made sense to me um and then the deer in the story uh come from a fairy tale that I can't find but I remember reading when I was a kid because um there was a, a fairy tale that I really really loved when I was a kid and it was a I don't know if it was like a real fairy tale or like a written fairy tale because as I said I can't find it it's the fairy tale where I got my name from because oh. uh I grew up with the name Sarah which means princess and I was never a very princessy kid you weren't. And I remember reading this story at one point and it was in some book of Celtic fairy tales and it had a witch named Surika in it and a princess. And they both had a herd of deer and the witch had deer with silver hooves and the princess had deer with golden hooves. Uh, and I basically was like, I'm I'm sorry, I'm on her side. This princess is insipid. Most of them <laughs> were when I was growing up. Yeah, I like this witch. She goes around fucking enchanting people with a flute. She's got silver's better than gold, you know, like all of these reasons. And then I found out that Sarah was the Irish for Sarah, and I was like, oh, dope. I'm 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 the I'm I'm a witch. I that's <laughs> that is my choice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that yeah. is where I go with that like dividing line of that name. That is that, and it was like. And weirdly, I, I thought that that particular story was in a book of fairy tales and I thought I knew where it was and recently was telling somebody this story and they were like, you were oh, telling wow, me at some stage. Yeah, I've heard like, this where before. where is it? And I and I went and I looked in the book that I thought it was in and it wasn't. So it has it has since disappeared, um, which I also think is kind of appropriate in it's a weird a way. Call, anyway, call out to anyone who knows what fairy tale that is. <laughs> uh, anyone, anyone recognizes Erica. it. From that description, find a um, childhood story that <laughs> made her claim her name. I know. Ask Quelga. But it uh, was it was like that was kind of you know you were talking about kind of pulling from different places and pulling from different sources, and that was one of the things that I was like, oh, that would just be kind of fun for me to put in the deer with the silver hooves, and have those those be Sive's deer, and then also have her be the the person who decides to be one of them. And who kind of, you know, instinctually hmm. chooses to be with the deer uh, and chooses to be with the wild. And, and you know, a deer is a is a prey animal. A deer is a deer is a great form to choose if you're feeling hunted. Um, yeah. And that's yeah, yeah. that's kind of that's where they come. That's where that kind of came from as well. And then, you know, I will always because of my own biases, I will always pick the version of the story that gives the the female character a little bit more agency. I mean, it's a it way of telling it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I'll always kind of like look for that. Yeah. So I think it, it makes it a bit more because um, there's something as well about listening to a story with a passive protagonist. That's di oh. that's more difficult. Like if you're listening to someone who doesn't do anything and it's just a series of shit that happens to them, it's like, oh, lady, will you please fucking do something? Do something. Um, yeah, I know so it is frustrating. And it also becomes, again, more and the Scott S series is really interesting because um you know it's 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 asking us to find information and not always be super you know true to it because there's there's not always enough information this story you know again the the fur Derek who was in or the fur Derek uh the the dark or man Durka. Dark for Durka yeah again he's fucking called a few different things um and like he in one version he imprisons her uh keeps her in his fortress and it's um one of his manservants that goes and tells her if you get if you get to fium cool's home home that's the only way of breaking the curse because did we not make that up 
No, 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 no. That's not my. Oh, I thought, we, that's I not thought you image. made that up. Sorry. No. I thought you had. No, no, no. Um, that's you'll find that that's ours. Uh, either um the Lady Gregory version, or I'll, I'll try and put it in the in the notes down below. Mm. Um, so that's not that's not a meism or an usism. Uh, that was a, a way was. of no, because the it made sense in terms of the um the the curse if it was a curse to be placed on her the only way to to break it is the impossible thing to get near mm-hmm. the one man who loves hunting deer more than anybody mm-hmm. else so uh yeah again it's but again all of the agency essentially leaves her uh because it's yeah. somebody else doing something for her well and, i mean you no know, she kind of she runs out and escapes and takes into her own yeah, hands i guess but i i think i think that's the point at which she she kind of regains some agency and in that version is that she's the one who then goes like it, it makes it not a coincidence that she runs into Fionn McCool. It makes it something that she decides to go and do, even though it's terrifying, which is like walk into the house of this great hunter and be like, maybe don't kill me because <laughs> I'm secretly a lady. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, 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 again, I just I love the the shift again, Rube painted it beautifully between piano and shifting into a string guitar and and kind of bringing that kind of hunt together the feeling of Ireland the blossoming and then the kind of the the pay this the slow I mean you're, you're doing it with your voice anyway the methodical change of tone and pitch and, and rhythm when they do have that moment of love that moment of happiness the moment of her going yeah fuck this is a lot better and yet she's always haunted by this ever present fear mm in the background and like it's that kind of thing that I I presume only people who were I mean we were talking about should we have a um a warning on this podcast uh more so more more than Mm. any other others because like people who have experienced abuse could really be brought back to that sense Mm. of fear and anxiety um because that's that's that thing that lingers you can't get rid of it I know and it's and we've we've always had that We've always kind of had that conversation around trigger warnings where it's like, well, Jesus, if we do one for this, we kind of need to do one for all of them because there's something in all of them that could be a trauma trigger for a lot of people. But like, I think that's just sort of a bit of an ongoing conversation that we're having and that maybe people could let us know if they have any thoughts on as well. Um, Mm -hmm. Just because mythology is very kind of, you know, not safe for a lot of stuff. Like there's an awful lot of, I mean, we sometimes do it in live shows, you know, uh, the death tales of the Ulster men will often kind of go, eh, by the way, trigger warning, because a lot of dogs get murdered and a lot of people are like cool with hearing people getting killed and not cool with hearing about dogs, which is, you know, totally fair. And, you know, some people have experienced abuse and some people have experienced trauma and and some of the stuff in like mythology and in Irish mythology is very visceral. And it's very brutal. And we kind of try and tell it in a way that feels like the people in these stories are people, even mm. though they're larger than life. And even though the events are larger than life, we we kind of try and make it so that they feel like actual people. Um, and I think that makes it, that can make it very visceral. And it did with this story. Like the first time I told this, this version of Sive, I remember telling it in the Harbour Bar in Bray just before the break oh. and nobody would make eye contact with me. <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ. Like it's just, you can't. Like, no, you no one can't. like, normally at a break you know people are coming up and talking and asking questions and buying pints Ooh. and like i i was just like walking around in this weird little bubble where nobody would look at me and i was like oh did i go too far did i i may have gone too far oh my god yeah um, i mean you know it's it just, just again it's just that power of, of changing perspective on something you know it's, it's a power of flipping it into the thing that you don't expect to look at because I think that's what we're, you end up doing with the Sive story more than kind of any, like you could tell Deirdre and the Sorrows from Deirdre's perspective and mm-hmm. you can lean on these stories from the female perspective. And oftentimes they're just a better story if you do that, mm-hmm. because as you say, it's not just a, a series of events happening to somebody. It's uh, the main character having quite a lot of authority and mm-hmm. autonomy and making their own decisions within and the struggle. And like she really. And that's lost- one that. Sorry, to, but like an example of that being something like uh, Dermid and the, the daughter of the country under wave. Like that's a yeah. great one from her perspective. We've done that live, I think, as often from her perspective as we have from his. Sure. Because it's yeah, fantastic. Yeah. And and I remember the first time we did that, the two of us were both like, 
oh wow that's yeah that's a lot yeah. better like that's that and really very similar very similar plot like you know the mm. a, a woman from the other world who is either yeah well he cursed into the shape of a hag and runs away um and is only allowed to he's the only you know lying next to somebody one of the th- fena uh, being the cure for her curse and you know the the slender bit of knowledge we get about her is just a couple of lines you know you don't know who she is she's just the daughter of under on un- king underwave and and then it's all about Dearman and all about the fiend mm. and all about the crack. So then you, you you have to paint that picture and and even like I was I was really impressed with some of the brush strokes <laughs> that you uh, that you how you paint that world because it really does open up that level of creation and it it mm. it, it gives that's what Irish mythology we constantly say it like it 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 allows you to really get both creative and visual and that's why there's so much more art done about I think with our Irish mythology than there is kind of movies which is much mm. more exact and has to be like you know, well kind of... you you really need to like nail stuff down to a level yeah. like if you look at Irish mythology versus you know Greek mythology or Norse mythology like obviously in Norse mythology a bunch of characters were taken and put in comics and wildly changed sure um and and there's a you know, we were talking about concretizing things a couple of weeks ago when we had the goddess Boan and and like new favorite word. I'm I'm quite I'm quite happy that we don't have that level. Like I I would I think it would kind of you know it would be a little bit sad to see a Marvel movie with Ku Cullen in it because I just feel like anything that they put in there I would just be looking at and going oh, no or oh, it's wrong or so oh no mm. yeah uh, speaking and like Danu you know. actually. Uh, Danu skincare commented on one of our posts, <laughs> and uh, they my my girlfriend went on to um their her, her Instagram and uh, bought a, a beard oil. I, I got it today because <laughs> it's Valentine's Day, and uh, she just she didn't want to men- name drop candle tales, and uh, she said, "Oh, my my boyfriend's a storyteller," and uh, she she wrote a lovely message saying, uh, "I hope I get to hear a story sometime," Aww. and uh, so I think she did, and she might be listening to this sometime. So uh, oh, thanks, Danu listen. skincare. Uh, for the, for, <laughs> For the Mananon beard oil, and uh, hey, she like, also said, "I hope your Mananon likes the beard oil." It's like, ah, oh. no. Uh, anyway, sorry, uh, but okay. like, no. I mean, the, taking <laughs> things as inspiration and taking things as you know, artistic inspiration or creative inspiration for whatever your whatever art you're doing, and you know, yeah. that includes setting up businesses and setting up small businesses, and you know, trying to trying to make a little bit of a positive impact on the world. Okay. It, it, that's that's all great. But I think, you know, there's there's also that massive space in Irish mythology. Um, Whoops. My phone fell on the floor. Did you? Yeah. It's fine. <laughs> I apologize for the slight clatter. Jesus um, Christ. That was I very think well I handled. need a new desk. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. I'm oh, looking at my desk and I'm like, this desk like fully slants. It just that that phone was sitting on my desk and it just slid off. And I'm like, yeah, the the casters are broken and like the bottom of it is all fucked up. And you know, it's just it's fine. We're gonna take but a mild also, break now I? to thank our Patreon supporters for uh, purchasing us, giving us the power to buy sort a new desk. Look at this beautiful, <laughs> look at this beautiful microphone and this beautiful arm that you can see and this beautiful pop shield that I have. Yours is also in frame, but it's like less yeah. so. Like, can you just see the full extent of mine? And yeah, it looks really have, like kind of done that it looks better, real actually. cool. I mean, we don't have to, but this is thanks to Patreon supporters. Thank um, you, Patreon supporters. Yeah. Because you might you're allowing be us to get a new desk. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I think there's probably money in the kitty, but like if you want to, if you want to, if you want to help me buy a new desk and you know help us upgrade our equipment, you can find us on Patreon, and that's all we're going to say about that. Okay. Uh, as well as like um, massive thanks to people who are already doing it. So back uh, to Sive. I, I think we had, yeah that was actually pretty good because we forgot to mention the start. So now people who skip that bit have to listen to us about See. going on about patreon.com forward slash candle of tales because you don't uh, know okay, how long we're going to talk about it that's either that's the last that's the last one, <laughs> that's the last one. <laughs> yeah um, cunning oh so cunning so I mean what I was talking about 
before we got sidetracked was the the brush strokes that you've managed mm. to paint in terms of the other world. Uh, and I guess it's completely open to whether she is a, a queen herself, the daughter mm. of a queen, uh, what island she is is from, what kind of and then as far her... as I know it's very very much open to interpretation because I don't think it's ever actually said in any source what she is but like you know I decided to make her the daughter of a queen because I thought that would be like the most interesting thing for me was to be like okay she's you know someone and I think it's also partly about like building in contrast you know mm. we talked about this on the storytelling course like the 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 whole idea in semiotics of like creating meaning with difference and it it makes a more interesting story if she starts out somewhere that is good and that is nice and that is kind and her life is 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 pleasant uh and then she gets plunged into this this terrible struggle um Mm, and i also just kind of you know that was that was sort of what i was playing with and then there's all kinds of like beautiful little bits of evocative description of the other world that you see in places where it's like you know flowers and fruit on the tree at the same time and like the rain only falling very softly in the evening and you know sunshine all the rest of the time and clear skies which is just kind of I I always think it's kind of interesting to see what a a culture's paradise is yeah 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 yeah. you know there are parts of the world where it would be like and it rained a lot in the other world and it was great um, whereas in Ireland where it rains all the fucking time, it's like it rained exactly enough and then it stopped and stopped raining. And Dude. then you got nice clear skies and Out warm sun. Forever rain. Forever As to, wet cloud that you're in. Or permadamp. In. Just <laughs> always a little soggy. <laughs> it is, yeah. It's very moist. Very moist island. It's a moist island. Yeah. Air is moist. They should, they should. Do you know what they should call you? Should the, the Irish tourism board should call you Ireland? Mm, moist. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> yeah, I don't think you're gonna get that voice over. Oh. <laughs> I somehow don't think that our phone is gonna be ringing off the hook anytime soon. Uh, what? Oh no! I can't believe it. Um, yeah. Oh, Americans. Don't you want to come to the moist, moist land? Of <laughs> they don't come here for the weather, man. Nobody comes here they for the weather. They don't. They don't. Um, 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 oh, anyway, God. It's Please the paradise. tourism back sometime. Oh, sometime Jesus. in the future. Sometime um, in the future, we might have tourism again. For, wow. all the t- for all the times we were giving out about Americans, do you, you know what? I miss them. Yeah. I miss them a lot, yeah. Yeah. No, and it's nice. They, they lighten up accents. the place a bit. They do, yeah. And they're great they're fierce loud, in fairness to them. They're, they're grand and well able to fill up a bit of space. Yeah. It's funny they don't yeah. think they're loud and then and we think mm. it's, it's, yeah it's amazing like, wow just, I know. there's no subtlety just like it's great <laughs> just, just just an outdoor voice all the time an outdoor <laughs> voice and then a more outdoor voice hi how are you doing oh <laughs> god oh god ah! <laughs> you're supposed to hush and feel like and, and look like you're not supposed to be talking or enjoying yourself at least how how many Americans listen to our podcast now now that we've been like taking the piss out of them for 10 minutes oh yeah I mean like <laughs> I don't think a couple I, they love it they must love it I hope they love it uh, we oh, well, love listen. you Americans um, yeah, yeah. no we, we, also, we specifically love the ones that listen to our podcast yeah you probably <laughs> a very little small tiny bit of a percentage of them um, and, and also in the future listen to our podcast Basically, yes. all of the ones that are listening to us, like we're you're the good ones. We like yous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Say nothing about the other ones. No, so. no, 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 no. We won't get into that. That's sticky. That's sticky um, yeah. <laughs> so other worlds and paradises and um, you know, it was this actually was... one of one of the funny things that I noticed the first time I was in the Caribbean was that was that there was uh, flowers and fruit on the tree at the same time, and I was uh... like, holy shit, this is this is other world stuff. Yeah. This is fairyland stuff because you you yeah. like this part of the world you get such defined seasons you know there's yeah, so yeah. little light in the winter it's just starting to come back now in February you can really see the light coming back into the sky and then there's yeah. so much light in summertime like even though it's no often sleeping. rainy and damp like the fucking sunlight the sun is up mm. the plants are growing and like yeah it's gorgeous to see and you like you kind of just know and see that in, in in the in the soil as well of like you know the the the, the dew, dew drops or the raindrops or what are they called you are thinking um, of snowdrops i think snow which drops. is the name of a flower the other two are, are are just drops 
Right. Yeah, they always confuse <laughs> me that way. You know, they're yeah, like, which, yeah. which one's Condensation, flowers? flowers. Damp, moist, <laughs> yeah. flower. Okay, flower. cool. Yeah, um, <laughs> snowdrops. Snowdrops, yeah, I fucking love snowdrops. And all not moist, but flower. <laughs> not moist. Not, we've gone on a fucking terrible end <laughs> now here. Um, where, in other words, there are many, many uh, a snowdrop and, and daffodil. Um, I was trying to talk about the whistle. I was trying to fucking talk about the fact that uh, Saive in the other world, at the start of the story, loves whistles and is always giving the eye to the whistle player. And I just thought that was a really lovely way of getting that kind of um, insidious creepiness mm. to the, her being observed mm. from what started off as a lovely kind of a gesture. Mm-hmm. Oh, someone must know me so well that that I'm always looking at the the whistle player in 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 the in the tune or in the uh, music circle, and and then every everything else is the knowing of her and mm. what the really creepy comb of the the. And I think that was something that I was very kind of conscious of because, like, it's something that in a modern context you you hear about a lot in terms of particularly in terms of like online stuff, like young girls getting groomed by by people who have predatory intent. And a lot of it is mm. is just paying attention to people who are lonely. Like a lot of the, the most vulnerable people to that are, are the ones who are lonely and who wow. don't feel like anybody sees them. And like, you know, I kind of grew up in an era before that was so much of, a, of an issue, but like right. it's such a problem these days, like 13, 14 year old girls and like, thinking that this is flattering because it is flattering when you're that age and you don't know and then the way that that can turn yeah very yeah. very suddenly into oh this is not this is not actually this is not actually friendly attention no this is actually this and and it's so like once that switch flips it's so scary mm. and it's so terrifying to feel like you're being watched to feel like you're being observed to feel like you're not safe in your own house, like all of that shit is is like, you know, like we were saying, it's it's it, trying to make that feel very real, yeah, because uh, that's a very real feeling and it's a very real emotion of like, oh, someone's paying attention to me, sweet, this is really cool. Oh my god, somebody's fucking watching my every move. This is not sweet. This is not cool. This is. I, mean, I think that you really get that moment where she confronts him and says, right. Okay, uh, you're really old. Like I've known you for my entire life. You're basically, you know, that old guy in the corner. Um, and whatever. I mean, it's really interesting. We I watched um, Roman Holiday last night um, with. Uh, oh my God! What's the really Audrey famous? Hepburn? Audrey, Audrey, Audrey Hepburn. Hepburn. Yeah, an amazing movie by Audrey Hepburn, and she's the princess in. She goes to Rome with like some. Uh, country that's never named it's just like the country and she's like kind of but then you have the gentleman character who's in his 40s and Mm. she's a she looks 18 like and you you for the whole thing it's like it's her trying to escape and have some level of freedom and just joy that isn't just regimented and and always waving and doing the her, her obliged duty and then you have this kind of male representation of of affection and yet you know it can't ever last or ever and it's not a happy ever after it's it's not it's a beautiful ending where they just like okay look yeah fair play I, I won't i won't release the photographs that we took of you kind of having a laugh like you know um he could have and he could have made a made a hell of a story or a headline um but in but it was never really he was never threatening he was like so uh, opposite to a threatening male presence and mm. that's kind of where you know even as I cast this story in my mind the far dark is just such a threatening presence mm-hmm. he's such a, a larger dominating obsessive comp- and, and he's he's made his life about her and that conversation he has with Saive where she confronts him and says this is something you has come from you and I want you to name it and then he names it and he, he just gets that like, oh God, that's out of love, that's obsession. That's yeah, yeah. That's this amazing. is not this is not flattery. If anybody ever says you're the only thing in my life that makes it worth living, run the fuck away. Run away. That is not a loving statement. That is emotional abuse. 
but it, you know it's so away. it's so funny to look back at older movies and the casting of of mm. characters who have a massive age gap Not like even that much older like fucking i mean that was one of the things one of the james bonds was it roger moore i know we are this is older movies but like one of the james bonds quit because he said the bond girls were the age of his granddaughter like the girls that were being cast opposite him as love interests were like still 18 and you see that like you can you can get that graph for like Hollywood leading men and their love interests and and they go up and up and up and the love interests stay the same fucking age. And it's yeah. still there. Oh, it's still there. It's less it's obvious. It's still creepy. It's, it's um, definitely less obvious, but it is definitely creepy. And like, I think it's it's one of those things that I guess this goddess series is kind of like showing you know, it's, it's holding a mirror up to society in a lot of ways, as, as a lot of art yeah. will kind of do and kind of going. And like, it's not to say of... that it's not to say that like necessarily an age gap relationship is always a terrible idea, because I know people who like have very successful relationships where there is an age gap. But like, you know, it's that thing of if if an older person is going out with it with a much, much younger person and habitually goes out with much, much younger people. That's because the people their own age are wise to their bullshit, basically. <laughs> like <laughs> really much, yeah. You might you might be honest with me. If you're and, only ever going out with 18 year olds and you're 45, it means well, all of the 45 year olds are like, all right, you no, I'm not dealing with you. You're too much. You're there's also like this kind of like thing that we always brought up with in school of like, ah uh, yeah, but but boys don't mature um mm-hmm. until much later. Women mature much earlier. So therefore um, women are responsible for boys behavior yeah. yeah 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 like and you have this well i wasn't gonna go there i mean like i mean that's par- like in part that's what it is because you don't hear you know you don't hear boy you know hey boys girls mature quicker than you so you should listen to them and respect their leadership you hear <laughs> right. you hear girls mature quicker than boys therefore you know boys are not really responsible for their actions but girls are yeah, yeah, yeah. Like yeah, that's yeah. how the culture twists it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, and look, and like, and, and that's that's the weird kind of thing, the sex thing, like uh, where, where even and it is, it is, it, it, it's it's fucking grossly unfair, first of all, uh, and it's very skewed and, and you know fucking very untrue in other ways. No, there's, it's totally untrue. I mean, I remember having this conversation with friends of mine when we were in, when we were like you know, post-college, like that we all as girls heard that line of like, well, girls mature quicker than boys now. And we were all kind of good girls in school and stayed in at the weekend and did our homework and didn't get into mischief. And then as soon as we all got to college, we went fucking nuts because it was like, oh, happy days. Nobody's actually nobody's pushing this narrative on us anymore. We're, we're, we're free. And we all kind of had this like phase of or several of us comparing notes about this had this phase of just utter irresponsibility in college. And it was the kind of shit that like a lot of our male peers had gone through like five years earlier. So it wasn't even that like, like I, I don't, I don't buy that line in college because, you know, we're allowed. Yeah, to... yeah, yeah, totally. Because you can, <laughs> because that's part of it. But it was kind of a really interesting like, oh, maybe maybe girls don't mature quicker than boys. Maybe we're just told that we won't get away with shit the way boys will. Yeah. And we yeah, yeah. and we go, oh, we, you know, it, it's it's. Uh, like a lot of these kind of nature versus nurture things, it's difficult to kind of unpick exactly where the line is. But I'm always like, I've I've always found it a a, a particular line that I'm always like, who is that serving? <laughs> who's that? Who's that benefiting? Because it's not the girls. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's an, it's a weird one. I mean, like you know, it's it's really it's brilliant to, to paint this picture out and, and focus in. And it's a tough, it's a tough listen. I'm not going to lie. Like, I mean, mm. I think Rue did his absolute best to, to make it a piece of joyful listening. Cause it is beautiful musically. I think he's done a fantastic job on it. And like, it's, it's, it's beautiful and it's so sad and you know, it's sad. Yeah. Um, and, and like, I just I love that idea. I'm so glad that like there's other people who've kind of come up with that idea of well of, of her twisting and her turning, especially like her driving herself. I love how she, you create that idea that she twists and turns into the deer to run away again and then just mm. gradually pulls herself back to her humanity to have a son. Mm. And I mean, there's something about keeping it locked off there in the in the final moments with only her perspective, which is just like, oh, 
it, it's it's both tragic and I guess the heartbreak for me is always to go Jesus Christ the son that didn't ever have the mother only saw mm. his mother getting beaten and struck and then stolen away and the the husband the lover who came across his son the little deer to only find out years after that it was in fact Sive uh, that had been stolen away from him and like mm-hmm. the the male pain within that story is also mm-hmm. huge you know when like I guess as much as we explore the female narrative of, of these stories, like on, like it, it's skewed so often the other way to only show and, and tell the, the male's perspective, but well, it, it doesn't quite land on the pain on either side enough, I think. Well, um, it's, you know, it's, it's, it just, it's, it's that thing of like, when you hurt, when you hurt somebody, you're never hurting one person, mm. are you? Like if, if you were murdered, it would not just hurt you. It would hurt me and it would hurt our family and it would hurt our friends and that would ripple out. And like when somebody is abused, it does not just hurt them. It hurts their friends and family too. Uh, It hurts the people that they get cut off from. Like that trauma does, none of us are completely self-contained. And so what, what violence is done to one of us is done to a whole network of us. And it ripples out and out and out. And like you see that in this story of Sive when you do take it from the other perspective that like this terrible pain is visited on her and through her onto her husband, onto her son, onto her, her mother, family, fucking, you know, whoever her family her. are in the other world, who are yeah. if she has brothers and sisters that we never know about, that that pain ripples out and out and out. Mm. And that's, I think that's, that's very kind of true. And like for me in this story, I didn't want to, I didn't want to, to flip back to the boys at the end. I mean, I know one could, and I've, I, you know, you, you absolutely could, and it would be, it would be a, a, a totally valid way of telling it. But I kind of felt like the, the power in staying with Sive's, just Sive's story and keeping mm. that ending just with her was oh, it's visceral. that's what I wanted to do with this particular version of it, especially when I know that like we have a kind of companion podcast to this one. Oh, Oh, one hundred percent, and 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 I don't I don't mean to to loot uh, what you did mm. with it in all. In fact, I just I want to kind of highlight how 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 honing in on on just her perspective makes me then after the fact think of this idea of the rippling effect i suppose as you put it and and the original context of the story that we that we hear so often is is just the male perspective mm-hmm. and the male pain that goes along with it and the the thing that you know is is not really touched upon in society still and it's that idea of uh those you know boys don't cry and men don't show feelings mm-hmm. and and that's one of the things i i often say or would have introduced uh, the Fianna as like they were lads who they did great tricks and they did many fights and they got around in circles and they drummed and they cried and they cried manly oh, yeah. tears, manly heart but felt they're, tears. They're always <laughs> weeping. Like this idea of men not crying is a is a culturally very recent one yeah. and it's incredibly destructive. But like it does not go back more than a couple of hundred years. Mm. And like you read any mythology and they're all weeping all the time. Yeah, like Aeneas wept, Odysseus wept. Those are the that happens that comes up again and again and again in these stories of, you know, me, men who are violent and men who have big appetites and men who do heroic things. They're always weeping. Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table are puddles half the time, um, um, you know, like they're, so it's it's kind of it's I think it's that's one of the interesting things about mythology as well, is that it, it mm. does show you like. How how putting this idea of like emotion and vulnerability onto women only is yeah. is so destructive to men and it's so violent to men and boys yeah, yeah. and it's so untrue if you yeah. go any distance back into into the culture of our past and it's it's interesting that as soon as you mentioned even like the last couple of hundred years you're like well what what was really significant in the last hundred years there was a lot of fucking war Mm-hmm. There was a lot of young boys being taken off and and told, "Don't show your emotions, but go fight for go your die. country. Go die." And so, like, and the, don't show your emotions when you come back. No, 
like fuck me how badly they're fuck up the couple of generations that were now you know <laughs> like Jesus fucking Christ, lads. There's, listen, there's a huge, huge amount of transgenerational trauma in the world um, mm. and current trauma in the world. And it is it is that kind of thing of like it's passed on until somebody decides to deal with it. And so that's kind of what, one of the reasons why doing any kind of self-reflective work like is, is so difficult because you realize that at a certain point you realize that you're not just you're not just doing your own work. Deal you're also work, yeah. you're also unpacking shit that's like going back and mm. back and back and back and yeah, sometimes yeah. you don't know the story behind it you'll just be like oh that particular bit and like I as much like the, the you know one of the most beautiful things of i remember studying this in psychology and like hearing about bonding and kind of collective suffering and and nurturing and, the, and nurturing aspects of of women seems to be kind of scientifically kind of the idea is that women collectively get together when they're hurting more and they just mm-hmm. there's a there's a I mean I've seen it you know we've all seen it the mm-hmm. the tribe just whoomph, comes together goes right you're hurting what is it boom let's do the thing and men don't have that yeah. as easily at all and so when when men have hurt and pain the idea is to shut it down and remove it to appear strong and authoritative and then you did that release isn't there and sometimes they're the fucking guys who end up being those abusers or being totally. those whatever like because it's that level of not dealing with whatever and that's and that's the whole idea behind like the men's shed movement and all mm-hmm. of these different kind of support groups for men is that like this is this is a thing that humans need <laughs> this is a yeah. thing that human beings need and like you know you hear that about you know couples after breakups as well that like it, it's a, a romantic breakup is often much much harder on the guys because the girl because what tends to happen in straight couples in our culture is that the guy will use will just have the girlfriend to process his emotions with yeah and when when they're having a conflict or when they have a breakup he has nobody to process it with whereas she all along had her mum and her sister and her mates and her friends to process all of it with and continues to have them to process all of it mm. with. And he has now nobody because he was only doing that work with her. And like that, I think that, you know, I think that's probably also a thing that leads to a lot of breakups because I think a lot of women get real fucking exhausted when they're like, oh my God, I can't be your therapist. Yeah. Like as Very well as point. everything else. It's too much. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, So yeah. like there's all kinds of as with any of these things, like it's that ripple effect again of like it, nothing, nothing affects just one person. Nothing and ever. I think, I think it's, it's actually, this is a whole other kind of conversation that we've kind of started and we can keep on going down, which is fascinating. And I, but I, I love kind of looking, cause you know, this is kind of my, what we kind of talked about last week is like, how do you get men involved in this story about goddesses? Because, you know, for a long time, I've been thinking just highlighting female stories makes men's stories better makes the whole thing pick the picture better all over in many facets um mm-hmm. even if you're just talking talking about the story of it like it, it I just remember make it better i remember it being a really interesting conversation that i had with our brother neil when he was doing um he was doing a research project into like gender quotas for political parties Uh, which initially he was quite opposed to. And then he kind of came around to because he was talking about how, you know, we have quotas for different areas of the country, but we don't have quotas for or we didn't at the time have have quotas for gender. I think we do a little bit now. But anyway, um, but he made the point that when women are excluded from public life, he doesn't get the best candidate. And I was like, fuck, I never thought about it that way before. I always only thought about it as like, this is not fair for me and people like me. Yeah. But he was like, no, this is actually not fair on any of us. We're all getting robbed. We're all getting robbed of the best potential of humanity because you can't have it when half of humanity is excluded from certain yeah. things. And yeah. in both directions, you yeah, can't have the best carers if you say carers can only be women and men don't get into it. And you can't have the best leaders when people say leaders can only be men and women aren't allowed into it. Mm. So you're just all like fucking cutting in half human potential across the board when you when you overly gender these things. Speaking of overly gendering things, um, we're going to be talking to a very exciting woman next week. <laughs> that's a that's a cheeky segue. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I guess well, this is this it's is her a, a mission. Mo- 
her it's, mission is to go against that. Yeah. And, and you know, it, it's one of those, we've talked, Mel is a, is, is a phenomenal woman and she's batshit crazy and I love her for it. Uh, <laughs> I hope she doesn't listen to that bit. But she started the uh, very now popular uh, festival called Her Story and it's online, the website. We'll be talking to her next week in kind of relation to this this series that we put together mm-hmm. after uh, Knock On You, which is another slightly visceral uh, story. So um, a little bit. Um, and I guess if you're listening to these in se- sequence, you know, the next story has rape in it. So there you go. Yeah. Uh, True warning. Warning. Um, uh, but we'll be talking about uh, this and all the stories with Mel, who has a kind of shining beacon saying all of these female characters across history, across cultures, across uh, mythology. And, and been, today. And today. Um, just And she's just literally, she's shining a light. She's projecting mm-hmm. the faces of an arts of women across castles and loads of places all over Ireland. And it's fucking deadly. It's deadly. So, so. We'll, we'll be talking to her next week. We'll be talking to her about her story and where it came from and how we've been involved in it from the first uh, bringing the mythology side. And uh, that'll be a live stream because Mm -hmm. we're going to be doing, uh, we were doing weekly live streams for a long time, but we're now doing monthly live streams. So last Sunday of the month is the time to catch us on YouTube. If you want to pop over and uh, write in the comments, it's always going to see. Always going to see. So look, guys, thanks very much for listening. Stay tuned for more stuff. Uh, it's kind of Oshin and St. Patrick month next next month. <laughs> That's what I'm calling it. From and now. Sheila. Um, and Sheila, of course. Um, and uh, we'll be talking about the uh, the famous voyages of Irish mythology in March. And uh, yeah, till yeah. Th- we chat soon. We have one last goddess story coming at you. Um, and I hope you have a very good, safe, keeping, health, maintaining, you know, love brewing day and week and life yes <laughs> something like that something like that Thanks. i thought i run it off right I, yeah i don't know if that was round <laughs> <laughs> it was a bit star-shaped but... all right until next time <laughs> you.